Okay, great. So good evening, everyone, and welcome to this Hutchings Consultants webinar. Uh, in today's event, we are focusing specifically on the Welsh pharmacy market, looking at ways you may be able to increase your business value, uh, as well as a wider look at the sales process. Our expert panel today consists of Paul Steet, a senior pharmacy consultant at Hutchings Consultants, uh, who will provide an insight on the current sales market in Wales. Paul will also take you through the process of selling your pharmacy from initial valuation initial valuation right the way through to completion. Uh, Greg Williams of Hugh James Solicitors, uh, partner uh, and uh, head of healthcare at Hugh James, uh, is here to discuss the uh, legal overview with you um, of a pharmacy transaction uh, to ensure you are best prepared for the process uh, from a legal perspective, obviously. Uh, and uh, last but by no means least, Artif Butt from Hutchings Accountants, uh, who will be uh, talking about all the accounting aspects of a pharmacy sale and how you can reduce your tax liabilities so you walk away with more money in your pocket which is i think something we all want Artif. if <laughs> um, if you have any questions that arise throughout the webinar you can submit these anonymously using um, the q a button uh, at the bottom these will come through uh, to us and we'll be able to see these throughout the um throughout the webinar and we will uh, answer these as many as we can at the end of the session um so um yeah submit these uh, make sure you hit there's a submit button there after you've typed it we'll We'll then get these and uh, we'll be able to look at these throughout throughout the process um and uh, as i said we'll we'll get through as many of these as we can any that we can't get through uh tonight we will definitely follow up with you separately afterwards so no matter what it is just just you know stick that question in there and we'll make sure you do get an answer from us so uh with all the introductions done um i will hand over to our first presenter this evening paul steet paul over to you Okay, fantastic. Thank you for uh, uh, joining us, everybody. Um, it's, uh, you're welcome. Uh, and uh, uh, our three presentations this evening uh, will explain uh, the process involved in selling your, your pharmacy business from valuation through to completion. The knowledge and advice we're sharing with you has the overall theme of seeking to minimise your stress during the sale and maximising the price you eventually walk away with. All three companies have years of knowledge and experience in pharmacy sales, and understand how a pharmacy transaction should work. For those of you who've not sold through Hutchinson Consults before, I just wanted to briefly explain that we are the largest independent pharmacy only agent in the UK. Our typical sales will range from single pharmacies with a turnover of around £300,000 up to small groups with around £100 million turnover. We've been approved and recommended by the NPA to its members for the selling and buying of pharmacy businesses since 2005 and are currently the only NPA supplier to reach platinum status. We have an excellent reputation in the pharmacy sector, and there's no potential for a conflict of interest to arise during a pharmacy sale through Hutchins Consultants, which could create an issue uh, for you. For example, we don't receive a referral fee or commission when introducing buyers to finance brokers or to solicitors, as Greg will testify. Um, overall, we have an wealth of knowledge and experience in selling pharmacy businesses. And this enables us to provide you with an insight on current factors affecting the market. So how has the uh, pandemic affected the market? So before I move on to explaining the process of valuing and selling your pharmacy business, I'd just like to sort of briefly share with you some, some insights um, from, from what effects we've seen. I'm going to run through some key business performance indicators for you as well. So despite the wide-ranging challenges thrown up due to COVID-19 over the last few years, the market has remained buoyant. Pharmacy has been viewed by many buyers as a relatively safe haven when compared to other more volatile sectors. New buyer registrations across the UK rose significantly in 2020 and almost doubled when compared to earlier years, although last year's figures saw a return to more steady levels. We've been approached by potential buyers from outside of pharmacy keen to invest, although the vast majority of completed deals have been agreed to buyers already operating in the sector. The number of pharmacies coming onto the market fell in 2020, as you might expect, um, and early 2021, as many owners were either too busy dealing with the fallout from COVID, or they may have wanted to understandably take advantage of the increased income generated. However, this changed in the latter half of last year, as many owners finally found some breathing space to contemplate a sale once more. Most notably, in 2021, we experienced a 33% increase in Welsh pharmacy sales compared to the previous year, demonstrating many operators' pent-up desire to sell. The major banks who traditionally lend to the pharmacy sector have remained supportive, 
although they have tightened their lending criteria and are heavily scrutinizing lending applications from buyers. I will now run on to uh, sorry. I will uh, now run on through with you uh, some of the key performance indicators of most interested buyers and sellers. You'll see over the next few slides that in order to provide a benchmark comparison, I've shown UK-wide average figures, which include England, Wales, and Scotland. As a guide, pence and pound figures provide a broad overview of prices that are being achieved and demonstrates how much is being paid uh, for each pound of turnover. You'll see from this slide that average pence and pound figures for Wales have fluctuated since 2020. However, they have broadly been in line with average prices paid around the UK. In comparison to England, for example, buyers' confidence has been buoyed by the perceived greater support from the Welsh Government for the pharmacy sector, and this has helped support goodwill prices. Additionally, the wave of smaller, less profitable pharmacies offloaded by the multiples and larger groups seen over the last few years has now passed, and more profitable pharmacies have started to appear in the market. I must stress the point, though, that these figures show an average price. Every pharmacy business sale is individual, and there will be sales that achieve a price below these figures and others that far exceed it. This next slide shows the average number of offers received per sale. You will notice that since January 21, the average number of offers received in Wales has improved and remained steady, broadly in line with UK average figures. Inevitably, the reduction in the volume of pharmacies entering the market in Wales throughout 2020 had quite an impact on buyer activity in what was already a comparatively smaller market. The uplift in the instruction seen in 21 has coincided with increased buyer activity at a time when it has become easier to move around now that we've exited the various lockdowns. This may also reflect the increased number of better geographically located pharmacies entering the market for sale, resulting in more competition between buyers bidding to secure the business. This next graph shows the average multiple of EBITDA, also known as the adjusted net profit, achieved on sales since 2020. As I just mentioned, the wave of loss-making or barely profitable pharmacies sold in recent years meant many buyers reverted to making an offer based on pence and pound methodology. This had the effect of pushing up the EBITDA multiples. With more profitable pharmacies entering the market last year, we've seen buyers once more reverting to an EBITDA model when making an offer. An important key performance indicator of mutual interest to sellers and buyers alike is the gross profit percentage margin the business is trading at. As this slide demonstrates, margins decreased in 2021 compared to the previous year, but have since improved, and we are aware that many owners have recognised the need to focus on this area during these challenging times. So which group of buyers are the most active in the marketplace right now? While well, the majority of sales continue to involve buyers already working or operating in the sector, the largest proportion of which are first-time buyers. At the start of the pandemic, we had an uplift in investors from outside the pharmacy uh, sector registering with us, although this has now largely subsided. Group owners are active when the right opportunity arises, and some of the corporates and multiples have started buying again, having trimmed poor performing branches from their portfolios. All categories of buyers are making offers, creating more competition, which is a seller ideally you want to encourage. We continue to see a cross-section of buyers located elsewhere in the UK, exploring opportunities to acquire within Wales. In particular, pharmacies situated in coastal and more rural uh, areas can attract buyers seeking a lifestyle change, whilst those located along the M4 corridor in South Wales and the North Wales Expressway provide convenient access for buyers in England. Crucially, increased competition between buyers can strengthen the seller's negotiating position when offers are called in. This next slide shows the category breakdown for buyers on sales completed in 2021 and also sales completed and currently sale agreed in 2022 to date. As you can see, group owners and existing pharmacy owners looking to expand have been consistently acquiring over the last couple of years. Whilst in 2020, the multiples were the largest category of buyers, over the last 12 months or so, first-time buyers have increased their activity, perhaps as a result of more opportunities arising within their financial ability to bid for.
To demonstrate the buoyancy in the market, I wanted to quickly show you two examples of recent successful sales. I'm unable to divulge too much information for confidentiality reasons, but the first example was a pharmacy in South Wales, which had a turnover in the region of £900,000 and dispensed around 9,000 items per month. Following a period of marketing, we received five offers and accepted an offer from a first-time buyer at 7.8 times multiplier of EBITDA. This equated to a sale price of £1.3p in the pound. This next example is a pharmacy based in North Wales, which had a turnover of around 1.1 million and dispensed around 10,000 items per month. We received four offers and accepted an offer from an existing owner at 6.9 times EBITDA. This equated to a sale price of 87p in the pound. As we look further ahead into 2022, it's very hard to predict the market and what will happen to goodwill values going forward with any certainty. At the current time, we are achieving good prices. And whilst we anticipate more pharmacies coming onto the market compared to, to last year, we're not predicting an oversupply at the moment. New pharmacy contract in Wales with its shift in emphasis towards greater service provision and independent prescriber qualification will inevitably require a period of assessment and reposition of business strategy for many owners. At the same time, buyers also need to conduct their own research to understand the operational and financial effects of the changes. There are some headwinds in the economy and wider world right now, which may have a knock-on effect on sale values, such as rising business and staffing costs, increasing bank interest rates and loan repayments, not to mention the wider ge geopolitical situation. However, there are also positives as the pandemic has created a newfound respect for the pharmacy sector at both a governmental level and in public minds. The usual ebb and flow of banks entering and exiting the healthcare sector continues, but overall they remain keen to lend, enabling the market to keep moving. And we've seen a higher proportion of more profitable pharmacies entering the market for sale, retaining buyers interest in acquiring. Overall, all of the above factors feed into creating some uncertainty at the current time. If you are considering selling, I'd certainly encourage you to contact Hutchins and speak to myself or one of my colleagues. Once we have a, an understanding of your individual position, we can share our recommendations personal to you. So that concludes a brief overview of the current marketplace in Wales. Uh, but before I move on, we're just going to run a poll to gauge your thoughts on the new pharmacy contract, which uh, we'll feed back to you at the end of the presentations. Sam, can you start the poll, please? Uh, yes, Paul, I'm going to uh, launch that now. OK, guys, so you um, everyone should see that on their screens. Um, you need to choose an answer uh, and then hit uh, submit on the bottom right there. I can see a few of you are already doing that. Good. Um, and I'll, I'll close that in, in about a minute, Paul, um, and, I'll, and I'll just let you um, carry on um, uh, as is. I'll, I'll jump off. OK, thank you, Sam. So, okay, I'll now press ahead and explain the steps involved in taking your pharmacy business to market from valuation stage right through to completion. So before we can start marketing any pharmacy, we need to establish a value for the business and recommend a marketing price. A competent agent will want to understand your business before they can advise you and will need to gather financial information from you to continue. This is an example of the information we usually require. We don't wish to overburden you, but the more information we have at this stage, the more accurate we can be with evaluation. This will reduce the risk of disappointment for you when offers are called in. We review all the information supplied and produce an adjusted profit and loss. This establishes an EBITDA figure. We then calculate the value by adding a multiplier to this figure, and at the same point, consider any other factors that can affect the value. There are many factors a competent agent needs to consider when valuing a business. This slide shows some of the main factors, but there are many more. Factors such as wholesale income and private scripts, for example, will have a defined monetary effect on value. Others, such as the level of competition in the area or business potential, are harder to define, but still need to be considered. 
We're sometimes asked to value a business based on just the turnover or items, for example. We're usually reluctant to do this as it can lead to misleading figures. To provide a credible valuation for you, a professional agent will always need to uh, obtain a certain amount of information from you to understand your business. Most sellers understandably want to achieve the best price they can when it comes to a sale. You've worked extremely hard over the years to make your business successful, and it's important to feel rewarded for this when you hand the reins over to a new owner. As you've seen, there are a large number of factors that, that can affect that valuation, uh, but many owners ask us which areas of the business they should focus on to increase its value. For most pharmacies, there are four key areas to focus on as they can impact the saleability and value of the business. Firstly, gross profit percentage margin. As previously mentioned, this is at the forefront of most buyers' minds when looking to buy a pharmacy. As stated earlier, the, the average margin currently in Wales is around 31 to 32%. A slight increase in margin can potentially add significant value to the business. Take, for example, a pharmacy with a, a turnover of around £750,000 and a GP margin of 30%. An increase of just 1% in margin could potentially add around £50,000 to the value by the time a multiplier is added to the net profit, assuming costs remain the same. Many of our clients advise us they are devoting more time to the buying side of the business and spending more time on researching the best prices. Working hard to improve your margin will be time wasted if you allow your business costs to run out of control. If you're planning to sell, it's so important to keep a tight rein on your business costs. Both the buyer, their accountant and lender will scrutinise your profit and loss. Staff pay increases and ongoing bonuses, for example, will affect your bottom line, particularly if they're above the industry norm. I can think of one particular sale I had where my client had rewarded a long-standing member of staff with a significant bonus over a number of years without considering the impact on his bottom line and potential sale price in the future. I'm not suggesting you don't reward staff, but recommend you keep an eye on these costs, particularly in the run-up to a sale. Item numbers. Um, even though the new Welsh pharmacy contract encourages the increase in provision of clinical services, item numbers still remain hugely important in the marketplace. As it currently stands, buyers are attracted to busy pharmacies with strong increase in item numbers, and it's not envisaged for this to change for the, for the foreseeable future. I appreciate if you are planning to sell, this may not be an area you wish to focus on, but it will increase the sellability of your business when eventually you do come to sell. Finally, pharmacies operating on a lease basis should ideally have around 15 years remaining on the lease at the point of marketing. Banks usually match the term of the buyer's loan to the remaining term on the lease. So if you have a short lease of, say, less than 10 years, this can present an issue for a buyer obtaining the bank support that they need. Uh, a buyer who's perhaps an experienced pharmacy owner already with a good relationship with their bank may find it a little less problematic. Nevertheless, the lease should be considered for renewal if less than 10 years, if, if possible. If you feel this could be an issue for you, do speak to us before approaching your landlord, as we should be able to guide you on the best strategy around this. So coming back to what's next in the process, we have the confidential meeting. It's an opportunity for the consultant to meet you and spend some time understanding your objectives and discussing any concerns you may have. The meeting normally takes place at the premises once the staff have left the day. This allows us an opportunity to view the premises without alerting staff. Alternatively, if this isn't possible for any reason, we can conduct a mystery shop exercise, then meet you off-site at a suitable venue. During the meeting, we discuss and agree the marketing strategy, and it's also another opportunity to answer any questions you may have. The next step in the process is preparing the sales literature. Our sales brochure is designed to be eye-catching to potential buyers and covers the most salient points of the business, demonstrating profitability and potential. The key is also to provide sufficient information to buyers at an early stage in order to reduce the volume of questions they may ask. The marketing only commences when you, once you've reviewed and signed off the final document and are happy to move forwards. A confidential listing is usually added to our website as this generates buyer inquiries, but we take care to avoid disclosing the exact location of the pharmacy for sale. We also prepare a separate financials pack, which includes copies of the accounts, FP34s, VAT returns, OTC figures, and a copy of the lease if applicable. 
Before moving on, I wanted to talk a little bit about the different sales strategies we use to generate buyer interest. As I mentioned, we always discuss and agree with our client the most suitable strategy to use prior to marketing beginning. The most common strategy adopted is the full marketing approach, but occasionally we will recommend to clients a more discreet off-market approach is taken. Whichever approach we take, only potential buyers who have registered with us and signed our non-disclosure agreement are contacted. With the full marketing approach, an initial shortlist of buyers is created from our database of several thousand buyers. When researching buyers, the consultants will work, look at who's active in the marketplace right now, uh, who's viewing or making offers. Uh, also, as well, you know, who are the parties that we believe have the funds available to, to purchase. The consultants will also discuss the sale with other team members to seek their recommendations. So potential buyers then receive the memorandum of sale followed by the financial pack if they're interested. Those buyers are followed up and viewings generated as a result. We keep the marketing under constant review and the buyers list can be quickly expanded if necessary. Where we've we identified an, off, uh, an opportunity for an off-market approach, we will discuss and agree the process with the seller. A direct approach is made to the selected buyer or a handful of selected buyers who we believe could potentially have a strong desire to acquire the business, should they be made aware of it. If they're not already registered with us, we will request they normally do so and sign our non-disclosure agreement before they receive any information. Once the NDA is signed, they'll initially receive the memorandum of sale followed by the financials pack if they have a further interest. During the discussions with the buyer, they're made aware that they've been given an opportunity to acquire the business before it hits the open market and should therefore make a strong offer if they want to secure it. If for any reason we're unable to come to an agreement, we can quickly revert to the open market approach if need be. As mentioned earlier, this strategy is only appropriate in certain situations and is only recommended when a suitable opportunity has been identified. With the full marketing strategy, the average period of marketing where viewings are taking place is usually around six to eight weeks on average. Each pharmacy sale is different, however, so this period can sometimes be shorter or sometimes longer, depending on the circumstances. Hutchins use a tried and tested structured offer process that has been used over many years. Occasionally, we may recommend to a seller they consider an individual offer, but in most cases, when we feel it's appropriate to set an offer deadline and calling offers, we'll discuss and agree this with our client before setting a date. We use a formal offer template letter uh, to avoid any misunderstandings. This is particularly important with company share sales as they are usually more complicated. As part of the process, we request proof of funding and work to secure a deposit from the buyer if their offer is accepted. This is usually no less than £20,000. Following the initial round of offers, we provide some general feedback to buyers before calling in the best and final offers. This allows interested parties to fine tune their bids and helps increase the competition between them. Competition generated allows us to negotiate the best price and terms possible. Once an offer is accepted, we then move into the legal stage. So I won't go into too much depth about this as both Greg and Artif will cover this area in more detail for you, but we arrange for the buyer's deposit to be paid across to your solicitor who holds the monies in their client account. The deposit monies are held in accordance with an exclusivity agreement, which both the buyer and the seller are asked to sign. In exchange for paying a deposit, the buyer is also granted a period of exclusivity whereby other potential buyers are excluded from making an offer. We then issue the heads of terms to all parties, including the professional advisors confirming the sale. Our role as an agent then changes from one of marketing to that of sales progression as we consult with all parties during the sale to ensure the transaction is progressing forwards. Once an offer is accepted, an average time scale to reach completion is around four to six months. However, there are many factors that can slow this down, unfortunately, such as COVID-19, bank delays, uh, the NHS change of ownership process and, and lease issues, uh, to name but a few.
As I come towards the end of my presentation, I wanted to briefly highlight some of the key issues for buyers which can adversely affect the sale and even the final purchase price, which you as a seller should avoid if at all possible. This slide shows some of the various issues that can arise, but, but no means covers them all. I'll highlight three of the most common issues that we tend to see. We often see accounts which are inaccurate. This can have a detrimental effect on a buyer's confidence to proceed or pay a premium price, as well as impact the lender's willingness to lend. A common error in accounts, for example, is when locum costs are inserted in the cost of sales instead of appearing under expenses as with other staff salaries. This simple error can distort the gross profit and the GP margin, making the business appear less attractive. This can potentially result in a lower offer from buyers or in worst case scenario, no, no offers at all. It's important that your accounts are presented as accurately and easy to understand as possible to avoid creating any uncertainty on the buyer's behalf. Another common issue that can occur is when a seller employs new or additional members of staff after a sale has been agreed. Whilst you must continue to run the business up until completion, it's important that buyers are consulted about staff changes as extra staff costs could impact their funding or business plans post-completion. Without consulting them, you could leave yourself open to a buyer possibly seeking to renegotiate the sale price. The final issue that can cause a significant problem is where even a run to or during a sale, expensive contracts are renewed. An example could be for a new uh, computer system or software system. A new owner may wish to incorporate the pharmacy into an existing system they currently use or may prefer an alternative provider for other reasons. But ideally, where possible, these decisions should be delayed or taken in consultation with the new incoming owner, uh, as they'll be responsible for the ongoing cost post-completion of the sale. So when considering selling, it's important to appoint an agent who can provide guidance, support, and is prepared to work hard to achieve the best outcome for you. The team at Hutchins Consultants and our sister company, Hutchins Accountants, strongly believe that we have the necessary expertise, knowledge and skills to manage your sale and achieve the best price the market will pay for the business. At Hutchins, we have a close-knit team who have over 130 years combined knowledge and experience selling pharmacies. We take pride in the service we provide to our clients and work hard to achieve the best outcome for them. Our experience ensures we can oversee your sale right from the start through to completion. Although we regularly travel around Wales and the rest of the UK, all of our consultants are based in one central office, and this allows us to quickly share intelligence on buyers and activity in the current marketplace. We also collaborate closely with our colleagues at Hutchins Accountants. If an accountancy-related issue arises during a sale, we can quickly call upon their specialist accounting expertise uh, for advice. Uh, so many times their valuable assistance has helped keep a sale on track, which otherwise might have fallen through. We also have a large database of potential buyers who registered from all parts of the UK. They range from eager first-time buyers through to the multiples who we've got strong contacts with. This allows us to attract potential buyers for a pharmacy very quickly. Finally, we have a straightforward no sale, no fee agreement. There are no upfront marketing costs at all, and we only receive our commission once your sale is completed. So that concludes my presentation for this evening. If you'd like to discuss a potential sale, please don't hesitate to contact me or my colleagues. We can offer you a free verbal valuation, a free tax review. You can also arrange a confidential meeting with myself or one of my fellow consultants at your pharmacy. I'll now hand you over to Greg Williams at Hugh James, who will explain his important role in the sale of pharmacy business. Thank you very much for that, Paul. Um, just going to load the slides. Right, first of all, thank you very much all. Um, great honor to be able to um, have a, a quick chat with you today. Um, I'm following on from Paul's conversation, um, just to give you a, a brief legal overview of what to expect um, once you've decided to either sell or, or buy your pharmacy. So uh, a bit about myself. Um, first, the notice is that photo is definitely a, a pre-COVID and, and probably a pre-kid photo. So apologies for the, the selling of 
the photo and and the image on screen. Um, Hugh James, I don't know if um, those who don't know us, it's the largest independent law firm in in Wales, based in Cardiff. Um, I am a partner in the corporate commercial team and I specialize in pharmacy transactions. Um, we have a dedicated team that do this on a day in day out basis. And for example, over the last 12 to 16 months, we've transacted on pharmacy pharmacies with the value of 80 million, 85 million plus um, number of sort of transactions, both at single pharmacy level, uh, you know, new buyers coming in to buy, um, pharmacists buying for the first time through to group sales. Um, one of our best accolades, again, recently is the sale of the Shepherds Group, as you may have seen um, and know about, to Avicenna. Um, and that was the 36 branches that uh, occurred, um, I think, April, around this time last year. So moving on, sales pitch over. Jumping into um, the, the main presentation, it, the summary is to look at uh, a market overview um, of our experience of transactions, um, to run through the process itself and to sort of give a bit of guidance on what to expect. Key issues we're seeing, uh, general market trends, uh, observations on, on some of the key legal terms that you will see on transactions, and then some points just to take away with you um, and to consider um, when you do get to the stage of considering selling or buying. So uh, as Paul has already alluded to uh, and covered in his presentation, um, you know, we, we are still seeing from experience uh, high activity of, of deals. There's uh, a number of transactions ongoing in, in Wales at the moment and uh, across the UK. So, you know, the, the COVID bounced back um, and I think it has given some people the um, time to consider the next steps. So, so we are seeing a lot of um, inquiries. The market change in type of buyers, uh, again, Paul has mentioned the fact that the groups, whilst are still interested, and some groups more than others, uh, majority buyers we're seeing are the smaller groups or, or the uh, pharmacists buying for the first time um, where funding allows and with um, other outside interested parties, um, actually, with, with equity investment being provided in order to allow that pharmacist to, to buy the um, its first pharmacy or to extend to the group. Uh, funding, still still bankable sector. Um, we're seeing the main banks involved. In addition, we're seeing other entries, you know, Wesleyan is still active, uh, Unity Bank um, and, and various others that um, maybe would have seen uh, this time two years ago. So I think funding is still readily available. The type of uh, transactions uh, we deal with. Uh, Atif will go into more detail on this, uh, no doubt, as because it will have some major tax and accounting sort of consequences for you in, to consider. Um, from our perspective, we're seeing more share sales uh, than asset sales. Um, what I mean by that is obviously if the company owns the pharmacy, uh, the seller is selling the shares in the company rather than just the assets itself. And maybe that's because uh, the fact that, you know, supply demands and sellers come on the market, they can decree their terms. A buyer may want, might, might, might want to do an asset sale, but the seller can, can sort of, with a number of offers, can, can sort of look to get a share sale. The pros and cons to both, um, and tax accounting being some of the main ones. Um, but I've just set out on the slide some of the, some of the key areas to consider for a share or asset sale. So for a share sale, the buyer's pro is that it's the same business. Um, and what I mean by that is that you're not transferring the business, not transferring the NHS contract, um, which would involve having to get the change of control provisions agreed with the um, NHS Wales. So by buying the shares, you cut out that process. And in, in theory, it makes it uh, a quicker process because you've got less third parties consents required. Um, the obvious downside to a share sale is the fact that you take on all the inherited liabilities of the company. So whereas with an asset purchase, you are buying those assets that you want and you, you know and you can look into. With a share sale, it's it's a wider um, sort of due diligence process um, because you are then looking at the company's tax position, 
And if there are any issues that have um, previously gone on, then by buying those shares, you step into the shoes of the sellers and, and will be responsible for those obligations. Timescales, just to mirror what Paul's mentioned, um, you know, it, it, there is no definite fit all, but generally um, between three and four months, asset sales can take longer. Um, but NHS Wales actually does respond quicker than we are finding uh, over the border in relation to getting the, the process agreed for this practice and, and the appeal periods, et cetera. Um, third party consents do have an impact on that. So it could be the, uh, you have to get the landlord's consent and you're dealing with other parties that always gives a, a bit of an unknown. So very early stage is to, to understand what third party consents are required and to line those up in readiness for uh, a proposed completion. Um, one thing we are seeing is obviously when it comes to uh, a sale, it is a goodwill price. And if it's a share sale, then there is a, a linkage to a net asset position, which is something that, um, again, I think we'll, we'll discuss later. Um, the, the old principle of it is to balance the books of the company to leave it in a neutral position. Um, what we are finding is that a number of the pharmacies have a lot of cash, um, which stays in, in the uh, a company. So when it comes to completion, so it causes a bit of an issue in the sense that a buyer will have funding that um, is linked to the goodwill value, not the excess net asset value that the company may have. So, you know, a bit of advice on that is if you can extract it um, to, to look at your options, you know, into pensions and in, in doing it in a tax efficient way, um, there is a way that you can actually take it over and use the cash of the company and the buyer doesn't have to fund it. Um, it's a bit more complicated, but there is a means and a way to do it. So the, the process itself, I think, you know, once you find the buyer, um, it, it would be easy to think that, you know, the process is over and, and it's a case of just very quickly dealing with the uh, requirements to get the, the money and the, and the pharmacy sold. Unfortunately, uh, legal process is sometimes very involved and, and as we said you know the time scales can take uh, a while to achieve a successful completion so the, the key stages of uh, a process would be as paul mentioned the heads of terms where you basically set out the, the key principles being the cost the structure of the sale whether it's an asset or a share sale the, any provisions to deal with the property uh, and again, proposed timescales. It's a very important document, not legally binding generally, but it does set out the principles and gives everybody an aim as to how long they expect in this transaction to take. So, so I think either from a seller or a buyer perspective, it's good to have these principles agreed, even though they're not legally binding. The deposit agreement exclusivity pool has already covered, um, so I won't go into that in detail on that. But again, that's something that just needs to be negotiated and agreed at the start of the process, together with any confidentiality agreements that the buyer um, will maybe be expected to sign from the seller if they, if, if they do want sensitive information. So the next then is the key part of, of the transaction. Um, from a buyer's and a seller's perspective is the, the due diligence into the either the the assets of the pharmacy or, or the share sale, the, the share structure and, and further um, due diligence into issues such as tax, accounting position uh, and, and some more areas that you wouldn't have to go through for a business transfer. It is a key part of the transaction. And, and I think biggest reflection we find from, from sellers who go through the process is they didn't expect how long it would take and how much time it would sort of take out of their working day. I obviously appreciate that you're all very busy people, um, but this does take some time to, to pull all the information together. Um, and it is an important process that um, you do need to take time and effort on because those disclosures you provide means that a buyer is accepting those disclosures. And if following the transaction, a buyer turns around and says, um, I bought your pharmacy or I bought the shares in your company, but I wasn't aware of this issue and I wanted to look to pursue you for some sort of um, remuneration. Um, 
the whole point of the due diligence is to set out that you have told them about this information and therefore, you know, the buyer accepts it. The purchase contract, um, the SPA, the APA, um, lots of abbreviations, but it's the main contract that uh, applies on the sale of your pharmacy and it contains uh, a number of the protections that a buyer will be looking for. So it will have provisions in there, um, importantly setting out how the payment is made. Um, it will have protections that the buyers will expect from you as sellers or vice versa. Um, and those include restrictive covenants to say that a seller in selling the business will not be able to set up in competition within a defined area for a defined time. But the expectation is that anybody selling their pharmacy won't set up uh, in competition um, very quickly after that. Now, warranties and indemnities, you'll see I've mentioned uh, both legal terms, not much difference between them other than an indemnity is a much stronger protection for a buyer than a warranty. But basically, both of those provide the buyer with an opportunity to, um, after the deal, to look to recourse against the seller if um, those statements, those warranty statements, indemnity statements that are contained in the agreement are shown not to be true. So a big part of the legal negotiations is ensuring that the buyer protections are balanced. They are, um, you're, got, you're going to be giving uh, protections if you sell your pharmacy. There are going to be a number of pages of assurances that you will provide, um, but they have to be balanced. And any seller uh, or any solicitor for the buyer or seller will, will have those negotiations and to make sure that an agreed position is reached. The disclosure letter, which goes alongside the um, purchase agreement, this is a key seller protection. And it provides that all those warranty statements in the purchase agreement, this is the seller's opportunity to set out if they don't agree with those statements or there's some information that uh, contradicts those statements. And by setting that out to the buyer, the buyer is accepting again that information and would um, not be able therefore to have a recourse against the seller for that information. So again, a very big seller protection that, that needs um, a lot of input and that's where solicitors, accountants will obviously guide you through um, their experience and what to, uh, to answer those questions uh, and to ensure that you're protected as best as possible. Other documents that you will see on, on any given basis is a property uh, agreement, and that would be the purchase of the freehold, uh, lease assignment, new lease. Uh, as Paul mentioned, you know, from a, from a property perspective, banks concentrate very importantly on, on the property. So they will expect a lease, for example, to be over a certain period of time. So if you, if you know there's a, a short term left, then having less than 10 years could be an issue if, if it's a, a bankable buyer that will need to have, show the bank at least uh, 15 years in order to um, meet its requirements. Um, and also, as part of the arrangements, there's there's a numerous uh, ancillary documents, particularly on a share sale, where you will have um, numbers of documents that deal with the corporate changes. So as a seller, you do directors and shareholders, you need the forms to be able to transfer those uh, ownerships to the buyer. Um, and you will be surprised at the, the amount of paperwork that is produced to go alongside the purchase agreement. Employees are a big part of the process. Um, need to provide all the information on the employees um, and any buyer will concentrate on the employee position because obviously they step into the shoes and that's both whether it's a share sale or an asset sale. And if it is an asset sale, there is a process that needs to be followed and, and that process um, is, is set in law. So it doesn't matter what is set in the agreement as such. Um, it will need to be followed, and that means informing, consulting with the employees a reasonable time ahead of the completion. Um, what is reasonable uh, is it's not defined as a, as a set number of weeks, etc. Some sellers tell their staff very early into the process, which um, you know is fine provided the transaction proceeds. Some leave it uh, late because of the, of the sensitivity of, of the matter and maybe not knowing if the transaction is going to fully complete at that stage. Completion, um, so on the day, once all these documents are agreed, um, the way that basically works is the seller solicitors control the flow of funds, 
the bank will need to send the money to the buyer and the buyer then send the money to the seller or undertakings or letters of agreement. And once that money is in the um, seller solicitor's account, you are in a position where you're able to agree um, and, and to complete and date the documents. Now, completion, very rarely these days does that happen where you all meet and, and sign off on documents. It's a case of um, it's done remotely by emails and the seller solicitors and buyer solicitors um, basically deal with all the requirements. The pharmacist, the buyer, the sellers will, will meet up generally for a physical handover of all records, access codes, um, all the physical files transferred over. Um, and that is when the stock take is taken as well. Um, and there may be an issue of the current pharmacist remaining and staying in, involved in the pharmacy, either as an employee or, or, or a locum. Um, we don't get involved with that side of things too often and usually is on an ad hoc basis, but um, it, it can be a very important part of the process. If, for example, you've got a buyer who not able to staff that pharmacy from day one. So um, you know, sellers may be needed to step in and cover that uh, transitional period for, for a short period of time. And then following completion, um, whether it's a, uh, an asset share sale or a share sale, there will be some apportionment of um, sort of costs between the seller and buyer. So obviously there's a payment on completion um, but there's usually uh, then, for example, a share sale, you'll have a set of completion accounts that set out how um, a net asset position is agreed. Um, and there's a principle, for example, of seller solicitors preparing completion accounts within a period of time, usually linked to the NHS payment. So three months um, before all that, it, it comes through into the actual monies received from the NHS. The buyer then has a short period of time in which to agree or disagree with those um, accounts. If there's a disagreement, you would have to go to an expert to determine the, to the amount and, you know, say 20 years experience. Thankfully, that doesn't happen very often. And it's, it's a case of, you know, the parties agree the simple process and, and, and sort of agree and, and deal with that, um, usually three to four months after completion. So some general trends that, uh, that we're seeing uh, on transactions, Paul's mentioned deposits, um, not always the case the deposits are taken, but um, I think, you know, as a buyer, you have to expect that you may be required to give um, a deposit over, which is, uh, can vary in, in sort of amount. And the main thing of the deposit is obviously to focus minds and to, to give the seller some protection that the buyer is serious, uh, it's not, you know, to in, in continuing with the, the purchase, the deposit agreement itself was set of terms that if a buyer just pulls out and, the, and, and there's no good reason for that, then generally that money will go to the seller to cover their costs. Um, if there are good reasons, they usually the deposit agreement will set out that you know there's an issue that cannot be negotiated then the deposit maybe go back to the buyer so there's there's um, some negotiations and agreements to be had there retentions we we do see those it depends on the buyer but you know buyers can ask for retention what i mean by that is from the purchase price they will want to set aside um, some money in a pot um, which is held by the sellers solicitors buyer solicitors um, for a period of time and there's paperwork around that to set up that if there are claims under the contract that the buyer um, is entitled to set off from those, that retention, uh, the amount of money. Uh, it can be substantial amounts, you know, we can, we, we've dealt with retentions of 10 to 15% of the consideration for a period of time. And that again, is all up for commercial agreement. Now from a, from a general market position, there is no right or wrong on this, but uh, what we see and negotiate on, on our transactions, um, you would have limitations for the seller, which would be linked to a period of time after uh, completion when a buyer can look at the contract and pursue a buyer under, under the contract if the statements made are, are not correct. And again, thankfully, this happens on, on a very rare occasion. Um, but you do agree principles that if, for example, it falls without 
at very most, I'd say, 24 months that the buyers are stopped from being able to bring a claim. Um, you'd also say that if the claim is of a small amount, that that wouldn't um, be something that could be pursued, and it would be a case that it has to be a substantial amount. Uh, key problem areas, um, I think, as I, as I mentioned, it really is a balance, is a negotiation, and it does really depend on your solicitors as to how good or bad your protection is. Um, an experienced solicitor will um, be able to know the areas that um, need to be negotiated and agreed. Um, sometimes we, we deal with, with people who agree things we, we, we would, wouldn't usually expect them to. Um, so it's getting that balance right so that you can sell a pharmacy and understand that you know the contract you've signed is uh, acceptable to you uh, and you can sleep easy, not thinking that you, there's going to be uh, any problems that follow. Um, and property, whilst I mentioned, is, is usually a small part of the proceed price. Uh, it does throw up a, a lot of the work. The banks require the property for security, um, um, things like asbestos reports, fire reports. So the, the, all of these um, all this information needs to be available to a buyer and to the buyer's bank, more importantly, as well. Clawbacks, um, who pays for them? You know, CADM clawbacks or just general um, adjustments. Uh, usually it's agreed that the price is the price. Um, sometimes you see provisions for that. If there are any clawbacks, that there's an ability for the seller, the buyer, sorry, to um, request that the seller is partly responsible for those. So again, another key area of negotiation. And contracts, change of control provisions. I, I think Paul has mentioned that if you are entering into contracts, some of those contracts will have the ability for um, third party to terminate if another party it becomes the, the, the buyer or, or, or um, it's a change of, of the legal owner of, of the shares or the business itself. And that can mean that, for example, We've seen it recently on some some contracts for vans, which are very in demand at the moment. That that those parties are quite keen on cancelling the contracts because they can sell them out or rent them out at a at a higher cost. So very important that you you know if these contracts do need to change control and if consent is required, you get that consent. GDR compliance uh, is big in every industry. Pharmacies, um, because of the sensitive nature, um, buyers, particularly big group buyers, will want to see. And you are GDR, GPR compliant, and you do have the relevant information. I know the MPA, et cetera, advise on this. Um, so hopefully that's all in place. Employees, are there bonuses in place which could be considered as have to be paid going forward? Are consultants, consultants rather than employees, um, issues to be considered and, and will be looked at if, for example, a consultant is working more than just on an ad hoc basis? Uh, a buyer will want protection to say that if there is uh, any tax payable on that, 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 that the seller will be responsible. And just some points to take away. Um, I think, as we said, engaging professional advisors really will help your position. Deal with any issues, get, get ready for sale. Um, ensure all your contracts are available. Um, and that's the, as I say, there are no hidden clauses, which mean termination costs or, or change of control, and just look at reducing those high levels of cash if you're a seller, if that's um, if you're able to do so before the event. Thank you. Greg, I'm just going to just jump on quickly uh, before we move on to um, Artif, just to say thank you. Well done. You uh, you uh, pulled that right back. Uh, you you seemed unflustered uh, from from that uh, little technical hiccup that we that we had. So uh, thank you for. No, oh, my pleasure. And apologies for my IT skills. Um, usually, have other <laughs> people here to do that, but they've all gone home. Uh, sure, and it's not your IT skills that uh, we judge you on as a solicitor. So Good. fine. Um, <clears throat> um, where are you? Let me just get by this. Okay, yes, so Artif, um, are you with us? Yes. Okay, um, I'm, I'm going to um, hand over to you then, Artif, uh, if you just want to do the um, that screen share we, we did last time, and we'll, I'll just stay on with you to make sure that it does present properly. 
Thank you so much. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Sam. Brilliant. Hi, okay, everyone. Artif, I'll hand, uh, hand your hand to you, mate. Lovely. Well, hi, everyone. My name's Artif Butt. I'm the Senior Accountant at Hutchings Accountants, where we've been specialising in pharmacy sales across the UK for over 30 years. Today, we're talking about maximising the price of your pharmacy in Wales. We'll look at what steps you need to take how you can best be prepared, and some of the things you need to consider along the way to get the most out of the process. We've heard some excellent points from Paul and Greg on coming to market and the legal aspects of the sale, and now I'll be focusing on accounting and tax matters so you can get a comprehensive idea of what you need to be thinking about and when. We'll be covering preparing for sale, pre-sale issues, due diligence, the legal process, completion, and what happens after completion. Let's start by talking about the first step, preparing for sale and understanding your tax position. If you're thinking of selling your business in the future, it's never too early to start getting ready, even if you don't plan to sell for many years. Being properly prepared can make a huge difference in not only the price you eventually get, but also how much you're left with after paying the tax man to enjoy in your retirement. This has never been as important as it is now, with a number of risks and uncertainties facing the pharmacy sector and beyond. Now, we've all seen how the COVID-19 pandemic has changed our lives in a way that would have been unimaginable a couple of years ago. And even though we've seen restrictions wind down across the country, it's far from clear that this is over, and it's reasonable to expect it will have some impact on us for some time to come. Recent events and economic shocks, such as the UK's departure from the European Union and the current war in Ukraine, have contributed to rising costs in a number of areas. And the Office for Budget Responsibility forecasts UK inflation will average 7.4% this year. With the economy facing such an unprecedented challenge, we're also likely to see changes in taxes and reliefs coming in the near future. The Chancellor has commissioned a review on capital gains tax, which is an obvious choice for the next target for change, as it's currently taxed at much lower rates than income tax. The government made significant changes to capital gains and entrepreneurs relief two years ago, which I'll talk about later. Uh, and it's possible that we might see further changes to come, or even the relief being abolished completely. Paul's talked about the current state of the market and how it's been affected by current events. But as we've seen, there are a number of factors that can change things significantly over the coming years. Of course, it's not possible for us to predict what's going to happen, but the best way to manage these risks is to be as prepared as possible. Once you've decided you want to sell your pharmacy, be sure to get specialist advice that takes your individual circumstances into account. This will help you work out the best strategy for this eventual sale from the accounting, legal and marketing perspectives. Here at Hutchings Accountants, we start by reviewing your accounts and tax position to recommend the most efficient way to structure your sale and extract the profits. Getting this right can have huge implications that can make a difference of hundreds of thousands of pounds to your tax bill. It's really important to look at this as early as possible, as it can, getting the best tax treatment can sometimes involve making changes to your business years in advance of a sale. If your pharmacy is trading through a limited company, the sale can be structured as either a share sale or an asset sale, as Greg explained earlier. To decide on the right structure from a company for a company sale from a tax point of view, we calculate the tax what it would be from each option, as there is considerable difference in the tax treatment. A share sale means you'll be taxed personally on the gain and pay capital gains tax. An asset sale, on the other hand, means that the uh, company sells the business and is taxed on the profits. There's then a potential further tax charge on shareholders when you want to extract those profits personally. If you are considering a company share sale or a personal asset sale, you may be able to benefit from Business Asset Disposal Relief, or BADR, which was formerly known as Entrepreneur's Relief. BADR is a relief that can apply when someone sells part or all of their business and means you only need to pay tax at a rate of 10% on the gain as long as certain conditions are met. 
Each individual has a lifetime limit of £1 million worth of gains that can qualify, uh, which has been reduced from the previous lifetime limit of £10 million. In a share sale, the qualifying conditions are that you need to hold at least 5% of the shares and voting rights, be either an employee or officer of the company, and the company must be a trading company. These conditions have to be met for at least 24 months before the disposal. So without BADR, if you were to sell your business for a million pounds, you'd be liable to capital gains tax at 20%, which is 200,000 pounds. But if you qualified for the relief, this would be reduced to 10%, meaning you'd only need to pay 100,000 pounds, which is a huge tax saving. However, there are circumstances where you may not qualify for the relief. For example, where you're trading through a limited company which also owns investment assets such as shares or property, or which has a high level of cash at the point of sale. It's important to identify any problems as early as possible so you can take the necessary steps to remedy them. If you are thinking of selling your pharmacy in the next few years, we recommend you take advantage of our roadmap to sales service, which is aimed at pharmacy owners who'd like to increase the business's value before they sell. Using an initial valuation prepared by Hutchings Consultants, we identify key performance indicators affecting the value and look at how these could be improved. We also look at any issues picked up in our review of the accounts and tax position and work out the steps necessary to resolve them to ensure you get the most favourable tax treatment. Finally, we map out a list of prioritised targets we want the business to achieve and a timeline over which we want to achieve them. These can be things like reducing stockholding, uh, improving the business's growth profit margin, and making sure that the sale will qualify for business asset disposal relief. As part of our roadmap to sale service, we use customized management reports to analyze and monitor the business's performance. We also use the management reports to compare your pharmacy to similar pharmacies in a process called benchmarking. Twice a year, we review the results and reevaluate our plan where necessary. That way, we can also factor in any changes in circumstances and revise our targets and timeline accordingly. The aim of this process is to increase the value of your pharmacy as much as possible before it's put on the market. It's important to remember that every £100 spent on getting the right professional advice and input can increase the profitability of your business by thousands of pounds, which in turn can increase the value of your pharmacy by tens of thousands when it's time to sell. Now, as we've said, preparation is key. And it's worth looking in a bit more detail at some of the things we commonly see in pharmacy share sales that can cause problems or present opportunities. We talked earlier about the conditions for BADR. If you have a company with more than one share class, this may be looked at as some of the shares may not qualify for the relief at present. Your company also won't qualify if it owns too many investments or holds too much cash, as HMRC would no longer consider it to be just a trading company. The level of cash and director's loans can have other implications to your sale, which may need to be considered so that it can be dealt with as part of the transaction. Investment property owned by the company can cause problems with BADR, but we also commonly see pharmacy companies that own the trading premises that they operate from. Sometimes they might wish to include these in the business sale, but there will be cases where they want to take the property out and give the new owners a lease in order to give themselves an income after the sale. It's important to take tax advice on the most efficient way to do that. Another important area that's worth considering early on is what you want to take from the business in the form of salary, dividends and benefits in the years leading up to your sale. Tax rates on salaries and dividends are generally much higher than the 10% rate you can achieve on sale with BADR, so it makes sense to take less salary and dividends from the business if these are going to be taxed at a higher rate. This will mean the company's cash balance will be higher at the point of sale, and care needs to be taken that it's not so high that HMRC no longer allow the business asset disposal relief. However, it's also important to remember that some dividend income is taxed at 
7.5%, or it's now risen to 8.75% since April. And even after this increase can represent a tax saving over the rate you'll get on a sale with BADR. So it's well worth engaging in some tax planning in your final years of ownership to make sure you optimize your takings from the business so that you're paying the lowest rate of tax overall on your lifetime earnings. So these are some of the things to consider before the sale, but now let's talk about what happens once you've found a buyer. Greg set out the main aspects of the legal process earlier, and once your potential buyer pays their deposit, the next steps are the due diligence process and finalizing the sale agreement. As accountants, our job is to work alongside your legal team to make this all run as smoothly as possible. Due diligence process gets underway and the buyer's accountants will request a list of information. In a share sale, the buyers will want to go back over several years so they can be as comfortable as possible about the history of the company that they're taking over. Your lawyers will go through the sale agreement with the buyer's lawyers to agree a finalized version. We will also review this from a tax and accounting perspective, suggest any changes to the main terms and covenants, and carefully go through the warranties to make sure the buyers are made aware of any exceptional events or circumstances. You can see how important it is to engage accountants and solicitors who specialize in pharmacy sales to get this bit right, because pharmacy is all we deal with and we see so many sale agreements in the course of our work, we know what is appropriate and what is excessive to warrant. And so with our combined experience, we are able to limit your risk. In a share sale, the total amount you receive for selling your business is made up of the agreed price for the goodwill and fixed assets of the business and an adjustment for the net asset position of the business at the point of sale. The net asset position is made up of the company's current assets or things it owns or is owed like cash, stock, NHS and VAT debtors, minus the liabilities which are things that it owes out, like money owed to suppliers or HMRC. If there are more assets than liabilities, an additional payment is made for the net asset value. But if the liabilities are more than assets, a deduction is made from the goodwill payment. All of this is set out in the sale agreement. When the buyers are happy with the results of the due diligence exercise and the sale agreement is close to being agreed by both parties, a target completion date is agreed for ownership of the company to transfer. Once that date has been agreed, your accountants will need to provide the buyer's side with an estimate for the company's net asset position at that date. Of course, we're unable to provide exact figures, uh, so this is estimated. This, this estimate then gives the buyer an idea of the net current asset payment they will need to make in addition to the payment for goodwill and fixed assets. Once completion accounts have been agreed uh, by both parties several months down the line, a final payment can be made for the actual amount due as per the accounts. When we review sale agreements, there are a number of things we look at carefully. For example, the proposed method to calculate the net current asset figure as this will affect your final payment. The agreement also sets out the terms by which the business must produce the completion accounts and what the procedure would be if the accounts aren't agreed by the buyer. We also go through the tax warranties very carefully and cross-check them with the company's accounts to produce a list of any facts or circumstances that need to be disclosed to the buyer. Putting the time in to get this exercise right means you can sign the sale agreement with peace of mind and confidence that your interests are protected. After completion, the next thing we need to consider is the completion accounts. These need to be prepared with extra care and attention to detail to make sure they're in line with the sale agreement and also represent the closing position as accurately as possible. Once the accounts are prepared on this basis, they're sent to the buyer's accounts, accountants, and under the terms of the sale agreement, they will have a specified period of time in which to inform us of any disputes or to accept the accounts. After reviewing the accounts, the buyer's accounts will either accept them or send a list of any disputed items or things they believe should have been included or removed in the accounts. For example, payments made by the company after completion, which they believe were incurred before completion and so should have been paid by the sellers of the business. We would go through the points of dispute and try to agree them with the buyers and revise the accounts accordingly so that they are agreed by both parties. 
The buyer will then release the final balancing payment for the net current assets, which means you will now have received full payment for your business. The final step is declaring the sale on your personal tax return and calculating and paying any tax due. The sale will fall in a tax year ending on the 5th of April and would need to be reported in your tax return for that year. This would need to be submitted in the tax paid by the 31st of January the following year. As an example, if you sold your business on the 1st of January 2022, this would fall in the 21-22 tax year and your tax return and payment would be due to HMRC by the 31st of January 2023. If you were to receive a total of a million pounds for your business and assets and paid professional fees of 50,000 pounds, your total gains from the sale would be 950,000 and the capital gains tax due on this after the application of your annual allowance and business asset disposal relief would be just under 94,000 pounds. Once we calculate your tax bill, we can also advise you on ways that you can reduce it. If you haven't already, you should take advice on estate planning and your will. It's also worth considering your exposure to inheritance tax or IHT at this point. When you own your business, you benefit from business property relief, which means if you were to die, the business assets would be outside of the scope of IHT. But once the business is sold, BPR no longer applies and your share of the cash proceeds would be liable to IHT if you were to pass away unexpectedly. We also advise all our clients to talk to an independent financial advisor who can guide you on investments you need to make for a tax efficient income after the sale. And apart from that, you just need to decide what to spend the rest of your money on. A, uh, a worthy conundrum indeed, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Artif, what to spend uh, the rest of your money on. Uh, brilliant, Look, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to ask you actually if you can then stop sharing your screen. Absolutely. Thank you, uh, Artif and, and Greg and Paul for for your presentations tonight. Um, I'm going to share uh, the results of the earlier poll uh, around uh, feelings around the the, the new Welsh contract. Uh, but before I do, Paul, I know we have one more poll for uh, everyone to answer. Uh, yes, yeah. If that, if that's um, if that's okay, are you right to get that going again? Uh, yeah. So I will launch it now. But do you want to tell everyone what it what it, what it is? Yeah, it's just to sort of get get um, a bit of bit of sort of I guess sort of feedback from uh, where the attendees are in terms of their journey, in terms of uh, uh, you know selling sort of coming to the market. You know, is it something that you feel you're at that sort of point ready to? Uh, to take that step or are you in that sort of planning sort of uh, process uh, sure, sure. or a number of years down the line that, that that's all really so uh, um okay so great yeah, um, so I've, I've made that live now and i can see that a number of you have already submitted um your your answers as to as, as to where you're where you're at with that i'm just going to wait another 30 seconds or so and then i will go over the results uh for the first poll uh and and we've we've run over a little bit um uh today uh you know a couple of technical issues but um we've still got got a few minutes so we can get a couple of questions in we've had quite a few questions actually so i can i can see now that we're we're unfortunately not going to have time uh to answer uh all of them um but uh, um, as I said earlier, we will reach out to you. If we aren't able to answer your question, we will reach out to you individually following the webinar to make sure you have a full answer to your, to your, to your queries. Um, I also know that all of our presenters are happy to be contacted directly uh, after the event, uh, and I will ensure their contact details are included in the follow-up email that, that I will send you, um, which will also contain a link to the recording of, of tonight's webinar. Um, so... We've got those uh, answers that looks like we're in there. And I'm then going to switch over to this poll. And I can tell you that 38% um, of, of attendees uh, felt positive about the new contract. 19% um, uh, uh, felt negative about it, that it would uh, be negative for them, or they felt negative about it coming in. Uh, but 44% uh, were yet to decide, were, uh, you know, did, didn't yet know uh, how they felt about it, or I guess how, how, how it would impact them and, and, and how that would play out. It's, it's, uh, my understanding is it's still relatively new. Is that right, Paul? 
Yes, yeah. I think I think that sort of um, I guess sort of feedback that we're getting from 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 many sort of people is just sort of mm. getting their uh, an understanding of um, you know how 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 they got to adjust their business and um, uh, plan for it sort of going ahead basically. So uh, yeah, so yeah. yeah. I mean, more more positive than negative, but mm. but a lot of uncertainty. Yeah, yeah. So that's to be, I guess, unexpected when you you know you have these sort of changes sort of coming in, isn't it? So, uh, but um, yeah, no, it's interesting to uh, so just get that sort of uh, uh, feedback at these sort of early early sort of stages, you know. So mm. uh, thank thank you for uh, for 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 say so voting. Thank you. Uh, so we've got uh, yeah a few minutes here, and uh, Paul, we've we've spoken offline. I know there's um, uh, at least yeah. one or maybe two questions that you really want to try and get to tonight. Now, mm. is is that right? Yes, yeah, just um, so a couple, couple of um, uh, questions uh, come in. Um, uh, uh, one party have asked, do, do buyers tend to prefer a lease property or freehold? Um, uh, gen- generally, sort of speaking, um, uh, what we tend to find is that buyers do, do prefer to acquire the freehold if they possibly can. Um, obviously, a lot of that sort of depends on, on their financial ability to do so. Um, I mean, banks, um, yeah, our experience are that, that banks are you know, supportive of buyers when they can buy the freehold. It, you know, it gives them extra sort of security. Um, some of the loans that they're prepared to offer are more favourable as well on that, on that basis as well. So I think that can help um, sort of first-time buyers um, when they're sort of starting off as well, if if uh, as say they they've got other sort of you know the, the other financial means to to afford their repayments, of course, um, I think also it depends on the on the value. If a freehold is being sold, it depends on on, on obviously how much it is. I mean, and particularly in proportion to uh, the sale of the business of the goodwill. Um, I can think of one example. Um, uh, we've had in the past where I think the, the from memory the goodwill in the business was being sold for somewhere around sort of four hundred thousand, but it actually uh, occupied a fan, fantastic building, which I think the um, the value on that building was uh, close to a million. Um, uh, the nature of the business was naturally sort of attracting sort of first time buyers, um, but it, it created a little bit of difficulty there because obviously um, uh, you know that those first time buyers weren't necessarily having the ability to then sort of fund uh, a, a, a million pounds or purchase. Yeah, of course, as well, yeah. you know. So, um, but yeah, in short, generally speaking, yes, um, that that is sort of pref- preferable for buyers if if they can buy the freehold. Obviously, it doesn't mean that they 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 won't take on a lease, but um, uh, freehold purchase is normally um, preferable if 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 it's available. Um, the the other sort of question we had sort of coming was um, just, just quickly, Paul. Oh, sorry. Uh, I I will let you you carry on. Um, Greg, I saw that there was a question that came in for you, but I also saw that you'd answered it in your presentation. Um, so uh, if there's anything else that's, that's coming for you, I'm, I'm going to ask maybe if we we um, uh, deal with that offline. You know, if you, uh, you can follow up with anyone kind of kind of after the event, um, if if that's okay with you. And there's anything that you really need to get to or, or really want to get to tonight. No, absolutely. That's um, that's very good for me. And, and okay, that's that's, that's really helpful. Point. Brilliant. Thanks, thanks, Greg. Uh, Art, if there's anything uh, before I let uh, Paul steal all of the uh, Q and A minutes, is there anything that was uh, that, that's come in that you wanted to to, to address tonight? No, I'm I'm happy to give Paul the final word. Um, but but I would say, you know, it, it, just reiterate: if anyone has got any questions, they're most welcome to come to us uh, directly, and our email addresses will be available for them to do so. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll make sure that that, that is provided in, in the follow up email that, that I send. And, and I, I do apologise that we haven't had more time to go through through all of your questions. Um, but like I say, we will make sure you you, you get a full answer. Uh, but yeah, Paul, would you, if, if you just want to want to round off. Yeah, that's fine. It was just uh, say a question sort of came in about um, uh, which, which uh, part of Wales is sort of the most sought after from uh, from buyers. Um I think I sort of mentioned in the, in my presentation um, the I, I guess for uh, uh, as wide a scope of, of buyer interest. Um, ideally, they want sort of good, easy access. Um, and what we tend to find is, as mentioned, to so the buyers that are sort of from across the border in England looking to buy in Wales, access along the motorway routes, the, the M4, um, uh, the expressway, uh, obviously provide you know far, far sort of easier access in that sort of sense. So we tend to find, um, again, generally speaking, that sort of M4 corridor between sort of Newport across to sort of Swansea, a lot of activity down there. Um, But, you know, it really, uh, you know, as I sort of said, every sort of uh, pharmacy sale is individual. Um, I've sold pharmacies along the sort of West Coast, fantastic locations, uh, perhaps more remote. um, But we've had sort of buyers coming from sort of far flung reaches of the UK to to view. And again, as I alluded to, looking for that sort of lifestyle change. 
Um, so, you know, it, it, it's very much a case to say you're going to take and look at every sort of uh, pharmacy business on its own sort of merits. Um, but yeah, so if, just in, in terms of uh, attract as wide a scope as possible, that sort of uh, that, those motorway corridors, obviously, you know, just provide that sort of easy access, basically, you know, but uh, um, but yeah, there's lot, lot, lots of activity um, and, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's uh, so plenty of buyers looking from not just, uh, say, women in Wales, England, uh, Scotland, uh, Wales, um, sorry, Ireland as well. So uh, um, it's all about sort of um, how, how easy they can access the, uh, the business. Uh, that is great, Paul, uh, with just one minute to spare. Uh, so <laughs> I will um, uh, call it there for, for tonight. Thank you, Paul, uh, Greg, Artif, uh, all of you have done, you know, uh, great tonight. So thank you uh, for the work you've put into uh, to putting these uh, these presentations together and presenting them tonight. Thank you even more so uh, to everyone that's uh, that's attended uh, tonight and for your questions. I hope you have found it um uh, interesting and useful uh, and hopefully this is the start of a, of a discussion uh, you know whether it's immediately or throughout the next few years as you prefer, pre prepare to sell uh, your pharmacy uh, so from us at Hutchings Consultants uh, Hugh James Solicitors and Hutchings Accountants thank you and good night good night thank you all right all. Good night.